My name is Richard Heinberg. I've written uh, three books on the subject of peak oil, and I teach uh, at a small private college in Northern California called New College of California. <laughs> Well, peak oil is just the observation of the fact that uh, in any given oil reservoir, uh, production increases to a certain point, then re reaches a maximum and starts to decline. We've seen that in oil fields for decades uh, all around the world, and now we've seen a number of important oil-producing nations reach their peak and go into decline, including the U.S. and Great Britain and Norway and Oman, Mexico. The list goes on quite a while. It's actually most oil-producing countries. And so every year there are fewer oil-producing countries in the category of oil exporters and more countries in the category of oil importers. So at some point, probably in the very near future, global oil production is going to reach its maximum and start to go south. And that's going to have enormous economic geopolitical implications because the whole world is right now utterly dependent on oil for transportation, for agriculture, for plastics and chemicals. So peak oil is um, one of the great challenges of, of the coming century and probably of, of, of the coming decade. For the last 150 years, Every day we've had more oil available. We went from zero production in 1859, the beginning of the oil industry, to 84 million barrels of oil per day, which is what the world currently consumes. And that oil has enabled uh, the Industrial Revolution, essentially. More transportation, more manufacturing, more invention, more moving of goods. So having less oil to deal with means no more economic growth. It means an enormous challenge to the kind of world that we've created where we rely on these services increasing as population is still growing. So peak oil means really economic catastrophe for the entire world. We've never had anything before like oil. We've been using energy as long as we've been human, mostly through the, the food we eat, and then we've found other ways of harvesting energy from the environment, water mills and windmills and so on. But all of those sources of energy were minuscule compared to oil, which is very, a very concentrated source of energy. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of, of petrol in your car and having to push it off to the side of the road. You know that's hard work. Well, now imagine having to push your car 20 or 30 miles. That's the energy equivalent of something like six to eight weeks of hard human labor. And we get that for just uh, currently where I live in California, $2.50. Now You can't get work done that cheaply even in China. Uh, six to eight weeks of human labor for that amount of money so of course we've, uh, we've mechanized everything we possibly can over the past hundred years. Everything that involves um, labor output of, of energy into the environment, we've, we've mechanized. And so we've become completely dependent on our fuel-fed machines to do all the work for us that's required to maintain our industrial way of life. <laughs> America is the, the quintessential uh, oil-dependent culture. There are virtually no options for transportation other than cars and buses and, and trucks. And American communities mostly have been designed since the, the beginning of the automobile age, so it's really hard to get around American towns and cities without a car. 
So in fact, these days, there are actually more cars in the U.S. than there are licensed drivers. Uh, everything about the U.S., uh, the, the parking lots, the, the, the way roads are constructed, everything is built on the assumption that everybody is going to have a personal car. And that only makes sense as long as we have cheap fuel. When you think about how unique oil is in terms of its, its chemistry, its energy density, and so on, uh, to think that what we're doing with it is simply pulling it out of the ground and burning it as fast as we possibly can seems utterly outrageous. This is the most in unintelligent thing we could possibly do with this amazing stuff. I mean, possibly future generations will be able to think of interesting things to do with this stuff, but they probably won't have the chance because there won't be any left. Uh, now, uh, you could call this diachronic competition. In other words, we who are alive today are in competition not with other species so much as with our own descendants. We are actively reducing the survival opportunities of our own children and grandchildren. There's never been anything quite like this before in human history. One gauge of our success as a species using fossil fuels is the fact that there are now so many of us. When we first started using fossil fuels, there were fewer than a billion human beings alive. We achieved one billion right around 1820, early in the Industrial Revolution. We got up to two billion around 1930, three billion in the 1960s, four billion in the 70s, five billion in the late 1980s. We got up to six billion humans by 1999, and we've added more than a half billion more humans just since the turn of the 21st century. So if you look at, at that purely from a biological perspective, that's an enormous success for one species. But it's a very perilous kind of success because it's all based on the consumption of fossil fuels. Take away the fossil fuels, and what's the human carrying capacity of planet Earth? Well, no one knows exactly, but a good guess would be something like what it was when we first started using fossil fuels, which is close to a billion. Mm -hmm.